Hey, good morning. Hello, I know I'm not awake either. Um, I thought I was going to be at a podium, so I have this whole little piece of paper written out. I'm going to try my best not to mess it up too much. Um, I've been coming to Doc NYC since the beginning, and uh, it's kind of amazing to see what it's become. Um, it was just, a, I mean, the, the pamphlet, it was literally a pamphlet the first year, and now it's the damn catalog, and there's a million movies and panels, so it's quite amazing what Tom Powers has, has done. And in fact, it also played a big role in my career. Brooklyn Boheme, which was the first doc that I directed, not only played here, but uh, it was seen by someone from Showtime. Uh, and eventually, I, I, the, sh the uh, doc was bought by Showtime and aired on there because it's it screening here, Docking YC. So, uh, I owe Tom uh, a debt of gratitude for that. So um, what I thought I would do is talk about, I didn't really direct my first documentary until I was 50. And Tom wanted me to talk about sustaining a career in media. And so I thought maybe I should put down a list of every job I've had <laughs> before I got to direct a doc. Um, and I'll have a few little notes on <laughs> how some of those things shaped me, I guess. Well, the first one I had job was a cashier at a drugstore, which isn't quite fit this, but it's my first job, so I, should, I figured I'd note it. Um, then I was an intern at a black weekly newspaper, uh, and because of that job, I was hanging out on 125th Street in the Blimpies, on 125th Street, and a guy walked by with a uh, boombox, and it turned out to be the first introduction I had to hip hop, and I ended up being one of the early hip hop journalists, because I was hanging out in front of Blimpies, so you, know, you never know. Um, then I was an intern at a music trade publication, um, and I learned a very valuable lesson from the veterans. This is like in the late 70s. I'm a college student here in New York going to St. John's University. And the first rule of being a music journalist back then was to get to the press party early and get to the buffet table very early. Because if you got there early, you could get, do two rounds of free food, uh, which was a big deal for music critics back in the 70s. Uh, I was a rookie sports writer uh, at that time, and I actually uh, had the experience of Reggie Jackson yelling at me inside a Yankee Stadium locker room because he didn't like a question this little young whippersnapper asked him. Um, I was a neophyte film critic, um, uh, and I actually was at the premiere of Apocalypse Now in New York at uh, the sainted, now gone Ziegfeld Theater. I also was at the premiere of Exorcist II, one of the worst movies ever made. Uh, in the same theater, so you know, you never know. Uh, I became a staff writer at two different trade publications. I was a freelance writer for a black teen magazine called Black Beat Magazine, which was the black version of Teen Beat, Tiger Beat. You know. uh, so they paid 50 bucks an article, so you know, it was big money. I wrote bios for recording artists. Uh, I wrote a script for a PBS doc for Aretha Franklin, which was kind of like the beginning of my sort of entry interest in, in documentaries. I wrote a love story novel, not a romance novel, love story novel. Uh, um, published a couple of screenplays. I was one of the beneficiaries of the whole Spike Lee movement. When Spike, suddenly black folks were hot for about five minutes in Hollywood. So I got a couple of movies made in the early 90s, even though I don't know what the hell I was doing. And somehow we, we just managed to get through it. I was a correspondent for a syndicated pop culture TV show where I had eight hot dogs with the Beastie Boys. Um, a columnist for an alternative weekly. I, I'll get back to that in a minute. I did interviewed guests for a, like a weekly talk show, and um, I had to really, the most memorable experience was Don King, the legendary evil boxing promoter. Uh, I went to ask him a question in the pre-interview, and I could tell he, didn't, he really didn't like the question. So he had this like fake smile, but his eyes were the evilest, meanest things I've ever seen. Scared the hell out of me. I never forgot Don King's eyes. Uh, college lecturer, I was an adjunct professor at a couple of universities, blah, 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 did voiceover work. Um, finally, uh, around 2009, I worked on a documentary as a producer that actually won an award at Sundance, and that sort of was like the final arc. And so um, I'm 61 years old now, and I've been in media of various kinds for 40 years, and um, I'm not ready to retire because there's no retirement anymore. So um, I was trying to think, of I've been thinking myself, what are the lessons I can take out of my past and bring them forward uh, for myself and not just so. I'm going to pass you some of the things that I tell myself uh, all the time. And I, I, I call them lessons from a grown ass man. Um, and so uh, let me see. 
I mean, just let me just say this a little bit here because I think I, before I get into them, um, most of the publications that I used to work for are defunct, including my beloved Village Voice. The idea of making enough money to live in New York City as a full-time music critic, which was not unusual into the 80s, is an absolute joke now. It's like running with the knowledge that the bridge behind you is burning. There is no turning back. The world of nonfiction um, books, which I've written quite a few of, you know, fiction critical and cultural works, is still a viable profession. But if you really want to reach people, it's not the optimal way anymore to reach people when you write about culture. So a lot of the films I've done are really things that I would have made books 15, 10 years ago. Um, so now to the grown ass man part. Um, so I'm going to just say four different little anecdotes or story or sayings, I guess. Nothing is permanent, so don't get comfortable. Uh, I have seen entire businesses rise, flourish, and collapse, and I'm not talking about newspapers. Remember CD-ROMs? Um, anybody still using Netscape? How about Napster? Um, and of course, MySpace. I mean, these were huge things that were like ubiquitous that were going to change the world, right? Um, so I'm very leery of cheerleading the latest and newest new new thing, which um, I'm, my thought is capitalism is a hungry beast. You know, it, 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 newness is capitalism's addiction, and it is a serious junkie. And we become junkies as well of the new and the next of the fast. Um, so I invest a lot of my faith in the things that, um, that overcome trends and draw us back, not just to the past, but, but are still effective and useful now. Uh, and um, you know, speaking of CD-ROMs, you know, it's irrelevant. Those things are gone. They were a joke. Vinyl. People still love vinyl. Uh, it's um, you know, it was left for dead. It's beautiful. It's it's round. It's a big format. So you know, we constantly are looking for the next, but embracing the old that can be used for now, I think, is so important. Marvin Gaye, uh -huh. right? Marvin Gaye. The voice, uh, soft crooning, soft, gruff, versatile, tender, it still seduces us. You know? And Marvin Gaye is still an influence on new generations. So this idea of, of planned obsolescence, which is such a part of American culture, I think you often have to reject it in order to find the things that endure and find values and techniques that, that, that sustain us going forward. Figuring out what endures. What if the past remains viable moving forward? and figuring out how to merge uh, that past with whatever's happening now, it's not so much a challenge, but it is, it's the pleasure, I think, of being a creator right now. My second thing is writing the transition is everything. As you can tell, I've written a lot of transitions. Um, four times in my life, I have either was fired from or left comfortable situations for the relative unknown. In fact, I'm in one of those transitional moments right now. Uh, these transitional periods are scary and you often take a serious financial hit. But these moves are essential because they open you up to new ideas and experiences. Truth is, in this era of instability, everyone is kind of part of the gig economy. I've been living like this since I left my last nine to five job in 1989. That's how last time I had an actual full-time office. So doc filmmaking has been, in, retro in that respect, an easy world to understand. Unless you are a trust fund baby or, uh, you know, blessed with Wall Street connections, documentary filmmaking is one man transition to the next, one worthy hustle after the, you know, following the other. This world is not for the risk averse or the dispassionate or the timid. You are daredevil swinging through Hell's Kitchen on a rope. Um, it's having no idea how you'll finish, when you'll finish, or if you finish. It's breathing deeply and diving in. The third uh, old man thing is savor the journey, truly savor the journey. Any creative endeavor is a risk, but all the media business I've worked in and the making of docs is potentially the most dangerous. Dangerous to your bank account, to your uh, psyche, and your health. Completion can be years away. No one may care when it's done. Your subjects may hate the final product. You may make enemies who dog you long after the project is done. In fact, any number of government agencies or corporations may put you on their enemies list eternally. So much of the satisfaction, um, at least for me, comes not from the final result, 
but the moments on the journey. Seeing into the lives of people, watching how they negotiate life, deal with challenges, being there when they cry and fail, and when they have little victories and big triumphs. Uh, I'm having a bit, little, little failure right now. Um, is a real privilege. Being present when something magical happens, a question triggers a memory in someone, or your own location, and finally you put two and two together, and the story spins into another direction. Or that moment in the editing room, when two sequences become one, and the editor and yourself share smiles that give you the confidence to move on. Well, no one will know how that felt. Ultimately, uh, after film festivals and screenings and distribution deals have come and gone, it will be those fleeting, private, indelible moments that you will remember and take up with you to your next adventure. And I, I mean, I'm really a big believer in that because ultimately the work, it comes out, it enters the world. What do you really treasure from that? It's those camaraderie moments, those aha moments, those moments that no one will see but you and your team. And those are the things that you take with you, I think, for years and years, and then inform you because it's that feeling of togetherness, I think, that, that drives us else. You know, because in the final result, when we do docs, come on, let's be real, we're not getting rich out here, right? So we have to have that, that level of, of commitment to what we're doing. And my final uh, little bit is uh, don't throw away your hard drives. Um, and uh, that relates to a, a something that recently happened to me, and I'm going to show you a clip from. So 20 years ago, exactly September 29th, 1998, a photo shoot was held uh, on 126th Street between Fifth Avenue, I think Fifth and Madison, uh, and Harlem. A magazine that no longer exists, XXL Magazine, organized a, fo a, show, a, a photo shoot of, of rappers on this street. Now, the reason they chose that street was that in 58, um, Esquire Magazine and a photographer named Art Cass took a photograph of 58 jazz musicians called The Great Day in Harlem. So XXL said, let's do this with rappers. I was, uh, at that time, I had one of my side gigs. What was I doing? I was working for Chris Rock on a, a HBO show. That's when I met Don King. I was like the, I interviewed, pre-interviewed people for, for the interview segments. So I had a little tiny bit of money. And I heard about this photo shoot and said, this could be amazing. So I managed somehow to convince the publishers of the magazine to give me the rights to shoot the, exclusively to shoot the photo shoot. Even though I had no money, somehow I scammed it. And I got some, I got a, a bunch of guys it was cameras, you got, a, you got a Canon, I got, you know, whatever, you got a Bolex, and we got about three cameras and we shot this whole thing. Then what happened is, of course, you know, the rights weren't cleared, all, of, all the rappers didn't sign the paper, and we had argument with the magazine, so basically, fuck it. So this stuff went into a bunch of hard drives and they were in somebody, they stayed in somebody's garage in New Jersey for about 15 years, all right? So I get a phone call, um, about a, um, a book called Contact High, which is a history of, of hip hop photography. And they, they're really focusing on that um, photograph in it. So it's like, do you have any footage? There's a little bit of it on, on new, online now on YouTube. I hadn't looked in these hard drives in like 15 years, literally. I'm in it, I didn't even know I was in the damn photo. I'm wearing a worst Fat Farm t-shirt ever. <laughs> um, and there's all this great stuff, it's, it's really an amazing, like, wow, I've been sitting here and this thing's been sitting, and in many ways it's gotten more important. I think if I'd done it at the time, it would have been kind of a trendy, hip hop's hot, blah, blah, blah. Now it's a look back at a moment in time. Uh, and 20 years ago, in, it's kind of like, the biggest rappers who were there were Rakim and Slick Rick, for those who were hip hop fans, right? So, uh, and it's just after the murders of Biggie and Tupac, and so there's this whole, um, Lovey-dovey, I mean, it's totally a love fest among these MCs, as you'll see. So it went from something that was in my hard drive to uh, something that um, now I'm trying to make into a full-fledged doc. So uh, I showed ten, this 10 minutes at the Schomburg Library um, in, um, about a week ago. So it's a little inside baseball for some people if you're not head pumping, but I think you'll enjoy the vibe if nothing else. So uh, good morning. I hope you enjoy it. We just went through the f footage to, and put together like a 10-minute sort of flavor of what's there. And I really do want to make it very verite. 
uh, because um, it's something very immersive about being in a space with all those guys. Obviously, people who aren't hip-hop people are going to have to figure out how to give them more context. There's so many people in it. And quite honestly, I, I've been around hip-hop a long time. I don't know everybody who walks through that screen at all. So that's you know, one of the challenges would be in trying to interpret it for a larger audience. How do you let people know who's there? Because some people are very significant um, historically, and some are people who had one hit and disappeared. Um, but it's really interesting to, to also look back at even the fact that we shot so much of it on that, that digital video format, which was like the hot format, like it's ugly as hell, right? But it, you know, that's what we had. We do have actually some, we, we found we have some eight millimeter, someone had a little eight milli camera that, looks, that actually looks better than this, but we still haven't transferred that footage. So I just say, this thing, I mean, I also think about the Aretha Franklin doc that I don't know how many people were there this week or saw it. That was sitting in you know, the, 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 the bowels of Warner Brothers films for 46 some odd years. So there is quite a bit of, of our history, cinematic history, that's actually still around that we kind of archival, and we probably have personal archival even from family, that when you look at it now ha can have an incredible amount of resonance if used properly. So this really woke me up to the fact that I need to go through all of my hard drives. And um, there's actually, I've actually found other things now from, from the 90s and stuff that I had sort of forgotten or was a project that never got finished, that now seems like, oh, it really actually, that's actually interesting to re see that now. It may not be a feature documentary, maybe it's something B-roll, or maybe it's a short f thing later, but um, this idea that we have this, this wealth of material. The other thing that, that, uh, that came out of this that made me think about was uh, photo albums. Because I've also been trying to reach out to folk, well, there are so many photographers there. But I realized, it made me realize that people don't really have photo albums anymore because they have everything on these damn phones, right? And so part of the ritual I, I remember of going to anybody's house was their photo album, right? Or the pictures in their apartment, in their home. And people don't even have any pictures in their home anymore, not, because everyone has everything on these platforms. So this made me go back, and I actually went to, I finally used the cloud, which I was resistant to use. And I printed out 100 of the digital pictures that I have on my phone. And one of my Christmas presents this year will be framed pictures that I've taken of my family and friends of mine that, you know, we kind of, it went on Facebook, it was hot for a minute, they got 20 likes, and then it, you know, goes away. But these pictures that we used to treasure, so I'm, I'm literally, I, I printed out these photos and I'm gonna give them to my family and pictures of my friends from trips, stuff that we kind of took for granted as part of our texture. So I guess that goes back to the idea I said earlier about honoring or things from the past. We've kind of discarded the photo album, but I, I loved going over people's houses and seeing them when it was seven years old. So I, I feel like all of the, uh, it's all a kind of a piece of how do you use the past or how do you use old things in a relevant way for now. And if you use them properly, they actually can enrich our lives now, I believe. Um, I think I have time. Anybody have one more comment or question? Or we just call it a morning? You guys got a long day ahead of you. So thank you for your time. Pleasure.